Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Now, we're continuing our journey through the story of the Bible. And when we were last together, we learned that Joseph had been placed into prison as a trustee. The butler and the baker under Pharaoh, which served in Pharaoh's main courts, offended their king somehow and were placed into the same prison as with Joseph. Now, these two men had dreams, but they couldn't interpret the dreams. And Joseph, proclaiming the truth that God is the interpreter of dreams, goes to God on their behalf, receives the interpretation, and gives the interpretation unto them. But he does so with one request. He asks that when the butler is restored to his rightful place in the courts of Pharaoh, that he would remember him, make mention of him unto Pharaoh, so that he too could be released from prison because he knows he's an innocent man. But as we learn in the closing verses of chapter 40, verse 23, the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but he forgot him. And that's where we pick up today in chapter 41. It says, it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed and behold, he stood by the river. So for two years, Joseph has continued his stay in prison. And he's remained faithful in his service to God while he is in prison. And yet Pharaoh dreams a dream where he stood by the river. There came out of the river seven well-favored kine or calves, heifers, cows, and they were fat fleshed, which means that they were very healthy. And they were feeding in the meadow. Now at the same time, seven other kine or calves, heifers, cows, came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean flesh. They were deprived and starving. And they stood by the other kind on the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean flesh kind ate the seven well-favored and fat kind. And then Pharaoh awoke. And not too long after he wondered much about this dream, he fell asleep again and dreamed a second time. This time there were seven ears of corn that came upon one stalk. And these ears of corn were rank and good. But at the same time, seven thin ears blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears ate the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke again. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled over these dreams. So he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt. Now these magicians have power, power from the dark side, but they are able to do supernatural things. And he calls all of his wise men. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was no one among them that could interpret the dream unto Pharaoh. But then the chief butler spoke up and said, Pharaoh, I remember my mistake. For when you were wroth with your servants, both I and the baker, and you put us in prison, we had a dream one night, both I and the baker, and we dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was in the prison a young man, he was a Hebrew, he was a servant to the captain of the guard. He was a trustee in the prison system. And we told him our dream, and he interpreted to us our dreams. And exactly what he interpreted came true. I was restored unto the kingdom, and he was punished according to his misdeeds by your very hand. And so Pharaoh, in verse 14, excited about the possibility of understanding his dream, calls Joseph out of the prison. And they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. They hurriedly got him and brought him unto Pharaoh. But first he had to shave. He had to change his clothing. He had to prepare himself to come before the king. He couldn't come as a prisoner. He had to be washed and clean shaven so that he would present himself before the king worthily. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I've dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I've heard that you can interpret. 
But notice what Joseph says. He's very careful not to take pride in this issue. And it would be easy to just let this slip by and say, well, tell me your dream. But Joseph stops and points out unto Pharaoh, it is not in me to interpret the dreams. God Almighty, Jehovah, Yahweh, the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he will give this interpretation unto you, Pharaoh. And I think that's important to notice because most of us would allow ourselves to be exalted by men as the interpreter of that dream. But Joseph is very quick to lower himself and says, no, it is not I. It's God the Father and he alone. Does this remind you of what Jesus said? Remember when the rich young ruler came unto him and said, good master? And Jesus said, whoa, stop right there. There is none good but the Father in heaven. And what he's doing is he's correcting the young ruler in addressing men as good in a proper way. And Jesus is saying, no, you don't give credit unto men. You give credit unto God. He is the one that deserves all the credit. Well, Pharaoh says unto Joseph in verse 17, in my dream, and then he goes through the dream again. And in verse 25, Joseph says unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. Even though they're two different dreams, They serve one purpose. There's one meaning to them. And God, Yahweh, has shown it unto Pharaoh what he is about to do in the land. Now, the seven good kind, or cows, are seven years. They represent seven years. And the seven good ears of corn, they are seven years. So again, the dream is one. Now, the seven thin and ill-favored kind, or cows, that came up after them are also seven years. And the seven empty ears of corn that were blasted with the east wind, they shall be seven years of famine. Now, this is what the dreams mean in verse 29. There will be seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after those seven years shall arrive seven years of famine. And everything that was gained in the first seven years of plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt Because the famine will be so severe that everything in the following seven years during the years of famine will consume everything from the first seven years, the time of plenty. And the famine will be so severe that everyone will forget about the first seven years, for this time will be very grievous. And the reason that you had the same dream twice is to show that this has been established by Yahweh and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now it's important to note here, Pharaoh is the king of Egypt. And even though Egypt was a pagan nation, they were pagan by choice because Yahweh's name was known throughout the whole earth. But men decided to serve their own gods, create their own gods, rather than serve the living God, Yahweh. And so when Joseph reminds Pharaoh that Yahweh is the supreme God and he is the interpreter of this dream, this isn't falling on a foreign ear. Pharaoh very much well knows who Yahweh is, but he has decided to reject Yahweh and serve the gods of his fathers, which they created, rather than serve the true and living God. And this is what Romans chapter 1 is speaking of when it says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they knew Yahweh, they chose not to glorify him as God, but they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. They professed themselves to be wise, but they became fools and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into images made like corruptible man and birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. And when you look at the gods of Egypt, that's exactly what you see. Well, the story continues in verse 33, where Joseph says unto Pharaoh, Pick a man out from among you, a man who is discreet and wise, and set him over all of Egypt. And let this man appoint officers over the land, and let them set back reserves during the great years, the years of plenty. And let these reserves be kept during the time of the famine, so that the land perishes not. And in verse 37, it says, The thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh, 
and in the eyes of all of his servants. This was wise advice. And so Pharaoh said unto his servants, can we find anyone like the man who stands before us? And notice what he says, for it is Joseph, this man, this Hebrew before us, in whom the spirit of Yahweh is. He is a spokesman for the living God. And whether I like to admit it or not, he has interpreted a dream that no one in my kingdom was able to do. And this proves that Yahweh is the true and living God. And so Pharaoh says unto Joseph in verse 39, there is no one in my kingdom as discreet and wise as you. So it will be you, Joseph, that will be over my house. And according unto your word shall all my people be ruled. No one in the kingdom will be greater than you, only I. And Pharaoh in verse 42, to signify this decree, took off his own ring from his own hand and placed it upon Joseph's hand. And he clothed Joseph in fine linen and he put a gold chain about his neck. And all in the kingdom of Egypt bowed the knee before Joseph because Joseph had been made a ruler over all the land of Egypt. Now think about this. It wasn't too long ago that Joseph was in prison. And it wasn't too long before that he was in a pit because his brothers had sold him into Egypt. And it wasn't too long before that Joseph had a dream where all of his brothers, his mother and his father would bow down before him. And we see the handiwork of God, the providence of God, the foreknowledge of God, the masterwork of God in placing Joseph in the very position where those dreams are going to come true. And it doesn't matter how much man tries to intervene to stop the hand of God, his hand will not be stayed. His ultimate purpose will be fulfilled. For let God be true and every man a liar, amen. Now in the same way you see this masterwork being worked out and fulfilled through the life of Joseph, think about the Lord Jesus. Hundreds of prophecies had been made about the Lord Jesus throughout the entire Old Testament, throughout the first 4,000 years of man on earth. And although we see men trying to intervene to stop that work, they could not stay the hand of God. When Herod had all the little boys killed that were two years and under, Jesus survived. When the Pharisees plotted often, to rid the earth of the person of Jesus, they were unable to do so until Jesus' time had come. And again, that's what we're looking for in this story is the similarities of what is taking place in Joseph's life and what will take place in Jesus' life. Well, in verse 45, we're told that Joseph is given a new name, an Egyptian name, which means treasury of the glorious rest, and he's given an Egyptian wife. In verse 36, it says Joseph was 30 years old. When Joseph began his rule, when he began his reign, when he began the process which will eventually lead to his ultimate exaltation, he was 30 years old. How old was Jesus when he began his ministry? 30 years old. Well, the dreams become a reality, and in verse 48, it says, Joseph gathered all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt, and he laid up food, or he stored back food, in all the various cities. Joseph gathered so much corn, it was like the sand of the sea. It was without number. Now, during this time, Joseph and his Egyptian wife bore two sons. The first son he named Manasseh, which means causing to forget. God has caused me to forget the years of my slavery and my imprisonment. And the second he named Ephraim, which means doubly blessed. For God has caused me to be doubly blessed in the land of Egypt. Now, another thing to point out here is that Jesus also came from Egypt. Do you remember in Matthew chapter one, where we're told Joseph is fleeing the hand of Herod? because Herod is, is angry that he has been betrayed by the wise men. And in verse 13, I'm sorry, it's actually chapter two, verse 13, it says, when they were departed, the wise men, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, arise, 
take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and stay there until I bring thee word for Herod is going to seek the young child to destroy him. Well, back to our story in chapter 41 of Genesis, the seven good years come and go. And in verse 54, we see the seven years of famine began. And when all the land of Egypt in verse 55 was famished, was suffering, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What are you coming to me for? Go to Joseph. He is the ruler of the land that I've set in place over all of these things. And whatever he says unto you, that will you do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses. Do you remember what Mary said at the wedding in Cana when she was informing the servants to listen to Jesus? She said, whatsoever he saith, you do. Well, the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened up all the storehouses, and he sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed very sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries round about came into Egypt unto Joseph to buy corn. And obviously, if all the countries are coming to Egypt, Joseph's brother, father, and mother aren't too very far away from Egypt. So when the famine hits them, they too will come to Joseph in order to survive the seven years of famine. And that's where we'll pick up our next time together, friends, in chapter 42. But today I want to encourage you again what you've already been encouraged through this story so many times is realize God has a plan for your life. And no matter what you think about your life, no matter where you are in your life, God is behind the scenes working out his perfect plan. When Joseph is in prison, he had no idea that he was going to one day rule over Egypt. That thought never crossed his mind. And you have no idea what God has set in store for you. But you, like Joseph, must remain faithful in the times of famine so that when the times of plenty come, God can work out his purpose through your life as he so wills to do. And that's why we're told in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, humble yourselves, lower yourselves under the rule of God, remain faithful in the times of suffering, so that God may exalt you in due time, according to his purpose and his will. Well, friends, I'm so thankful that you're again with us today, and I pray that you're being encouraged through these stories as we learn them one by one, and that they are forming you and shaping you into the person of God that he has predestined you to become. Now, as he wills it until next time, friends, I truly love you. I'll see you on the next video.